Welcome, everybody, to the Fretboard Journal podcast. I'm your host, Jason Verlindi, the publisher and founder of the Fretboard Journal magazine. If you've never seen it, I hope you'll join us. Go to fretboardjournal.com, click on the subscribe button. 2025 is actually going to be our 20th year doing this magazine. Uh, So we're going to have all sorts of special content and surprises and events in store. Stay tuned. But do join us if you haven't yet. The podcast, the events, the videos, all the other stuff we do is just the icing on the cake. The magazine is where I put most of my energy and where we have all these unique and amazing interviews and photo essays with people around the world celebrating guitar culture. So I am, for our YouTube viewers, in front of the camera for this intro. This is something I seldom do, but I'm doing it in the spirit of today's guest, guitar maker Daisy Tempest. Daisy is a young luthier out of the UK. She's just finished her sixth or seventh guitar under her own name. And she's telling the story of these guitar builds and her own personal journey like nobody else I know out there. Her guitars are already commanding 30 plus thousand dollars, which is just shocking and astounding. But as you get to know Daisy and as you watch these videos, you can totally understand that, yeah, of course, someone around the world wants to buy a work of art from this person who is very much an artist as well as a luthier. She films all her videos herself. She does all the editing herself. She's making these instruments and she's trying to make a living, making just a few instruments a year at most. So it's an interesting story. It's a great interview. There's a lot of food for thought here. I'd love to see your comments. And I would love for you to share this interview with all of your friends. So as always, if you love the show, leave us a review over on Apple Podcasts. And just know that every week I interview someone fascinating from the world of guitars here on the Fretboard Journal podcast. So we have an event called the Fretboard Summit. It takes place every August in Chicago. The next one is August 21st to 23rd, 2025. You can register for it at fretboardsummit.org. It is a gathering of all of our favorite people from the industry and folks like Daisy and Luthiers in the know. And we share knowledge and we get inspired and we hang out and we hear incredible music. It is a truly cool thing. If you don't believe me, you can go to YouTube, type in Fretboard Summit. You'll see all sorts of reviews from others who've attended. I hope you will join us. It will sell out, so you're going to want to sign up sooner than later at fretboardsummit.org. Our podcast is, as always, brought to you by a couple of brands that I want to mention. Mike and Mike's Guitar Bar, just a few miles away from me as I sit is sponsoring the podcast once again. The coolest array of vintage acoustics, electrics, synths, amps, and God knows what else under one roof. They also have an incredibly cool and dependable repair shop at Mike and Mike's Guitar Bar. So check them out, mmguitarbar.com. We are also brought to you by Peghead Nation, this incredibly neat portal where you can learn how to be a better bluegrass, roots, Americana, or jazz musician. Many of the instructors have been profiled in the Fretboard Journal before. It is a site that I use all the time to be a better player, and you can too. Use the discount code FRETBOARD when you check out there. You'll get your first month free or $20 off of an annual subscription. You can also use the discount code FRETBOARD over at stringjoy.com to get uh, 10% off your first order of Stringjoy Strings. Nashville-based guitar, mandolin, and banjo string company. They do custom sets. Really interesting. We've interviewed Scott on this podcast before. Check that out if you haven't yet. Go to stringjoy.com. Tell them the Fretboard Journal sent you. Again, this week's guest is Daisy Tempest. I'll include a link to her YouTube channel because she's up to something that I don't think any other luthiers are. She's got a knack for just showing the art of building a guitar like no one else. Really interesting stuff. I hope you enjoy it. And uh, here's my interview with Daisy. Daisy, welcome to the Fretboard Journal podcast. Thank you so much for having me, ma'am, because you've had some absolute icons on here. So when you reached out, I I actually had to sort of double check the screen (laughs) to see if you actually meant me. You and I go back a little ways because I remember we were going to run some of your illustrations in the magazine. This was back in your apprenticeship days, I believe. Mm. Um, So we had correspondence and then over the last three or four years or however long it's been since especially you started the YouTube channel I've just I see you everywhere now so it's time wow well you know clearly 
I think I think with YouTube especially, like there's so few luthiers who are actually doing it, then maybe it is easier to get reached that way. So I'm really glad that that's working. That's that's really positive to hear that the hard work kind of feeds back into the industry. That's nice. Yeah. Yeah. For folks who don't know, like, let's hear your story a little bit. Where did you grow up and when did the guitar bug hit you? Oh, wow. Okay. Well, you know, it's not, I, I'd love, I'd love to say it was a more interesting story, but I, I quite literally had a very normal life in that I didn't have a passion for Luthery from a young age or anything. Like I always gravitated towards making things. I wasn't particularly good at it. I'll be honest. I think I'm too scatty and I only learned how to channel that scattiness into actual skill, you know, in my early twenties, uh, because you can't really be scatty if you're a Luthier. Um, although I did my best to try, but yeah, I grew up kind of uh, trying to make things. My mother's an artist, my dad's a musician, very creative household. I knew for one thing that I wanted to be self-employed because that's the only thing I understood. Like my parents both were um, self-employed freelancers. And I, I actually ended up studying English literature when I left school at university, I was doing a master's in English. And I just like wasn't actually connecting with my peers in that they were actually working very hard and I loved it as well but I, I couldn't go and sit in a library from 8 a.m to 8 p.m I was like I'd smash out the work I'd get it done and then I would find myself leaning towards activity based uh things so for example I started making my own clothes and it became very apparent that I was completely consumed by the extracurricular activities like making my own clothes or drawing or or writing even just things that were more creative I couldn't do the academic lifestyle in that I couldn't sit still for too long I couldn't do that so I sort of thought quite critically about that and I thought wow I really actually need to make some changes otherwise I'm going to end up in a career that I simply can't do and I'm going to be very sad <laughs> so that was when I looked very objectively um, and wrote out some statements of kind of empirical statements so I wrote I don't want to sit still I want to work for myself I want to do something using my hands and then I these were sort of non-negotiables that I had in my brain and it actually really helps to look at those on a page and then beneath that I wrote I like music I like um you know making things again there were just sort of secondary statements that were true but they weren't deal breakers and and I actually came up looking with that looking at that list it sort of popped into my head I was like you know, I don't want to be in the music industry, but I like music. So how do I do that? Oh, I'll make guitars. Actually, to be fair, firstly, I thought I'll make pianos because I'm a pianist. Um, and then I was like, oh, bit, bit heavy, bit big, bit long. Uh, not sure I got the patience for that. Well, look, Steinway were doing everything that I saw was possible to achieve. And I was like, I, I don't think I have anything to bring to that. I think Steinway are perfect. I won't have any interesting things to bring to this and so I thought guitars would be good because I think that you know doing a preliminary search on the internet I couldn't actually find anything with ease that was the kind of company that I wanted to create and I didn't know why I had that sudden vision of a company that I thought I could create but uh, perhaps it's being British being around um, maybe snobby people in Britain like they you know they like to to think that they you know, for example, even when we're making cups of tea, we're just like, this is the best cup of tea in the world. You know, I had that mindset of being British, like everything I want to curate has to be perfect. And so maybe I thought if I'm going to do a British guitar company, it probably should like try and be the best. Um, so that's where I got my idea for sort of a, a bespoke service, much like if you went to Savile Row and you bought a suit, then you went to Primark and bought a suit. They're very different business models. And I thought, God, there's actually not that I can see anyone doing this for guitars. Of course I'm wrong. There are loads of people doing that for guitars. I just couldn't find them. And I'm really glad that I didn't look because I would have seen their work and I wouldn't have gone near it. Like I would have been terrified because it's everyone is so good in this industry. So that's how I fell into it. I did, I did a lot of um, writing emails to people. Uh, I've God knows who I wrote to. I don't think I did much research. Again, and I'm glad I didn't because I would have been very scared off. But I did the basic research to find some handmade guitars companies. And I wrote to them. 90% ignored me. Fine. 
a couple of them did reply and I managed to secure an apprenticeship with one of them. And that was me. Uh, I absolutely hated it to start with. I really, really couldn't get my head around it. I was very bad at it naturally. But the joy came in the fact that I was very stubborn about doing this because everyone looked at me when I told them I was going to be a guitar maker and they were like, that's not going to work. Uh, and luckily, I am too proud to admit that um, they were right. And what that led to was a lot of lot of hard work. And now we're here. So <laughs> I guess it's OK. Um, but I definitely didn't follow the traditional route. And I have a lot of respect for people who've managed to make it work without the use of social media and that kind of thing. So I think like chatting to you. God, if there's anyone who wants to give it a go, I'll happily yap away about how good social media has been and that kind of thing. Because I know you've got a lot of amazing people, you've had a lot of amazing people on this podcast who have done it the traditional way. And I actually feel like maybe my voice is useful because I haven't. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> God, I'm already like yapping away. <laughs> it's interesting that you're bringing this sort of outsider's perspective. And I think it's very much needed um because the guitar especially the very high-end guitar world it's a fairly stagnant audience they kind of all know each other there's sort of this um path where people take either going to one of the handful of guitar schools or apprenticing for this person or that person when you found your when you were apprenticing did you explain to your uh mentor your vision and like, I'm going to do things a little differently and I'm seeing this going on in fashion and I want to make a guitar brand for in this style. Or did you kind of keep that to yourself? No, I mean, I was very honest from the word go that I wanted my own thing. Um, I think at some point that became very difficult for him to um, accept because I think that actually my vision next to like my fresh vision next to his skills actually made quite a good business for him. And I was doing a lot of marketing work for him. And actually my education for like, when I was there was basically, I want to be careful what I say, because I think it's understandable, but it's, you know, I wasn't being taught how to make guitars at one at some point, it just stopped, uh, because I was more valuable as, as somebody who was coming in with, without the bias of the industry, um, and sort of, being I was I'm a businesswoman like and I think it's hard when you're a crafts person naturally like he was to kind of um I think I was very valuable to bring that into a workshop so there was you know a bit of tension around the time when I was like no I still want to do my own thing because actually I think my I probably would have created a very successful business if I wasn't the luthier um it just happened to be that I, I I'm a bit of a control freak and I wanted to do it all I, I'm guessing this is a story that is happening in guitar shops all around the world where uh, the newer, younger generation who is social media savvy and is making content, um, the older, the elder guard needs them <laughs> to kind of keep up. And there probably is this tension and, and yours, you know, might be the best known because you're on YouTube now and talking a little bit about it. But um, I bet it's happening all over the place. I hope it is because I think the, uh, you know, in my second apprenticeship, um, Rosie, I, I went to work with Rosie at Turnstone in my second apprenticeship. And um, she was an example of somebody who absolutely understood that she wasn't that. And she was like, I'm actually going to, you know, she had this wonderful way of remaining in a place of, deep kind of what's the word that I mean I think she managed to retain like I had a lot of respect for her but she still managed to ask me for help in a way that didn't make me feel like she was uh she needed my help but she wanted it and it made me feel very like valued and I think she did that really well uh, but yeah but she also managed to um still you know with her knowledge she managed to give me equal value obviously if not more she was teaching me the craft and it was like this beautiful mutual respect just as you put it and I really hope that that's happening um Rosie's not even that much more older than me um but she she had this like wonderful 
wisdom about her. And I think that was an example of the perfect apprenticeship where I felt valued. There was no hierarchy. There obviously was a hierarchy because I was in her space, but it was, I felt like I wanted to give to her business and I wasn't being robbed of my own um, kind of sense of individuality in that. Um, which was beautiful. So that I hope's happening. Yeah. And I think you're right. And there are some really wonderful apprentice mentor relationships out there that I, that I've spoken to people about. I know that Rory at Taron has a wonderful um, team and a good friend of mine worked for Rory. And again, it's like really good to see and actually call out people who are doing a good job. I think more so than doing a bad job. Um, because everyone's always trying to get better. Like no matter who you are, no one wants to be in a bad mentor apprentice relationship they're just everyone's trying their best so i think if we call out people who are doing a really good job that's so valuable i do want to tap more into this is the fretboard journal podcast we do need to talk guitars but i do just want to ask (laughs) you your skills at storytelling which i think are just exemplary and it's why so many people and and new people to the world of high-end guitars are probably finding your your videos and your youtube channel um, your skills as a storyteller are so great. Where did that come from? When you were growing up, was there a brand maybe far outside the world of music where you were like, these guys are so cool. I would love to know how they do it. Or does this just come naturally to you? I think, I think I've always enjoyed storytelling because, well, especially when I entered the industry, I didn't know how to do anything else. That was like, the only skill that I could bring. So I really like fostered that. And I tried to, because I, you know, I couldn't build a guitar, obviously, when I first started. So what I had to rely on was my other skills. Actually, I watched a great video by a friend of mine called Matt. uh, I always call him Matt Eastley, but it's not. It's Matt Esley. He's a woodworker. He's a fantastic storyteller as well. And he did a video recently about skill stacking. And, well, it was actually about um, a lot of things, but skill stacking was mentioned where basically you go in with a mindset to any industry it's like okay here is objectively like I have a guitar company or a woodworking company but there are like hundreds of thousands of people with the same business model so what you do is you bring in another skill like videography or storytelling and then suddenly there are less people with both of those skills and the more skills you add the less competition there's going to be so when I when I came into the guitar making I basically like honed in on the skill stacking and yeah I think that came from I honestly attribute that to actually having quite a diverse group of friends um, who do a lot of different things. I don't live in one area where I have like a certain friend group. Like a lot of my friends are very different and that helps me with storytelling because I get so much, I get such a rich tapestry of people in my life. And I think that's just where it came from, presumably. Um, I also think that... No, I think I don't think I think anything else. I think that's probably who I owe it to is just meeting a very broad range of different people. So you you mentioned there was was there a brand that I that I saw telling a story and there was that when I was designing my company logo because again if I knew anything about branding it was that you need to do that properly so I swapped my first guitar for a branding package from my friend Charlie who's a great graphic designer. He's done some really cool stuff but he he sat me down with a mood board and he kind of like showed me a few brands. And one of the ones he showed me was a brand called Painter, which is a jacket company. And they just have the most wonderful business idea. Uh, They're actually two friends, I believe, and they started this jacket company. And I would just, I can't really do it justice, just ad libbing. I think that you should go look them up. They're they're good. Painter is spelled P-A-Y-N-T-E-R, I believe. Um, So I would highly recommend looking them up. The storytelling in that brand is second to none and it speaks for themselves. They are sold out completely. They release like three batches a year and they're always sold out. It's really hard to get hold of one. So that's just testament to their brand. Yeah. The mere fact that you did a mood board as you were starting your guitar career says a lot about you and how you're viewing things differently. I don't think too many luthiers I know have done that. Uh, More should probably. Well, that's what I mean 
That was led by Charlie, my graphic designer. I would never have done that if he hadn't been my mate. And I've been like, do you want a guitar? It's going to be rubbish. It's my first one. But like, do you want it if, if you do my branding? And, and so that's how that's how you get better at things, right? You, you take from the people around you in a hopefully selfless way, but then you, you get you get so much from help from asking for help, you know, and I'm very okay to ask for help, um, which is actually great <laughs> and very useful. Where, when did you leave your last apprenticeship? My, my final apprenticeship. I left that in 2020. And ha- were you immediately, I got to hit the ground running. I need to do uh, all the things or was it, I'm going to make a few guitars before I really market myself? I, what did I do? That's a very good question, actually. Um, I had to make money. Like that was, that was fact A on my little empirical list. So I started really going at my social media because I knew that if I had social media financial support, whatever that looks like, then I could afford to basically sit in my workshop and experiment. Unfortunately, that didn't work because I couldn't monetize such a small amount of following at that time. So what I did was I applied for awards to get me free studio space. Um, So I actually got one of those awards. So I was put in a studio in central London for a year without having to pay rent. It was unbelievable. Um, I was actually, and and to save on on, uh, living costs, I lived in this completely run down three-story townhouse in Islington, which had no heating. It looked like something out of a horror film. It had never been done up. Like the carpets were peeling up. There was no heating. There was no like any lighting really um and it was 350 a month and it was like the oh no I had heating I had a fire like a like a an open fire that I had to feed with logs like it was so extra (laughs) it was so funny what year is this this was in 2020 (laughs) so like post lockdown the world had just opened up it was no it sounds like it's from 1820 yeah it was wild so I was doing that and just trying to like I would sit there by the fire every night just like with sheets of paper everywhere actually the people who owned the house were obviously hoarders because it was just covered it was filthy you couldn't clean it it was just honestly it was hilarious so anyway I was doing everything I could to like make this work um very close to having to get a real job um But I never actually had to because that's when I got an email from somebody who'd been watching my work on Instagram and they said, I'm going to pay you up front for a guitar. You don't have to make it this year. You don't have to make it next year. You don't have to make it in the next five years. I want you to make it when you feel like you can do a good job of it. And I want it to be a cutaway and I want it to be this. Here is the money. It's more than your base price. Go for it. That man like meant that I could do it. Like, I honestly, I attribute, and and I think just because he believed in my story, he believed in in me, and he is, I guess, the reason that I'm here. So I owe a lot to him. And then because I got to live on that for a while, I, I basically built, like, a few guitars. I did a lot of experimentation. I don't think I finished any of them, but I built different components. I redid the processes. I basically got used to making guitars on my own. And then I took orders and I think I got about 10 orders just straight out the gate just from the work I'd been doing on social media. So then it was history and then it's fine. And I'm very lucky that I had that interest. But again, it took a lot of work behind the scenes to get there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, did he get his guitar yet? No, I've told him that I'd happy to start it. And he's just like, why don't you give it another bit of time? Because I've never done a cutaway before, believe it or not. I've done it in my apprenticeship, but I still, you know, this guy, like this, I want to give this guy the best guitar I've ever made. And ironically, if you want to do the best guitar you've ever made, you still need to wait for one more. And that'll probably be the case forever, but I am going to do it probably next year. It's just like, you just got to do it at some point. Um, And you know that it's the best work you can do in the minute. But yeah, he's, he's very, very generous and very kind. He's got a big collection of guitars so he's like I'm not like desperate for it but you know I want you to do it when you feel ready so have you have you met him face to face not in person no sadly amazing amazing <laughs> there are angels out there oh yeah yeah I've, I've 
it's been majority angels, honestly. All of my clients have been absolutely phenomenal. Like, I'm so lucky. Yeah. So you started with um, Instagram was like your main channel at first. And then did YouTube come later? Yeah. So again, like people don't like pay you in this industry. Like Rosie actually offered to, I said that I wanted to do um, skill swaps and stay there for shorter, but she actually offered me a job, which was so kind of her. But yeah, people just don't like, it's so such a weird industry because it's such a niche skill. I totally understand, but that means it's really, really, really hard to get started. Uh, so I was doing these little drawings and selling them on my Instagram to like get some pocket money. Um, and that's kind of how it started. I, I was telling the story of my learning this craft through stupid little cartoons. Uh, my mom's actually a cartoonist. So I kind of, I always watched her do it. And I think perhaps naturally I'm all right at like getting emotion across just from watching her. She's, she's amazing. But that kind of started me regularly posting on Instagram. I was like posting half these stupid little drawings and they were selling. So I'd like draw the originals and then send them out in the post. And then I would do half just like, here's a little thing that I learned today kind of thing. Um, and people liked it because I think they like to be part of something, especially people who are maybe a bit older and they're stuck in a career and they, they kind of wish that they could have done this and they like to live vicariously. Maybe they wouldn't actually want to, but it's nice to kind of sit there and watch somebody doing it, especially someone young. Um, and yeah, it just worked. And for whatever reason, people connected with the content and that just made me really happy and made me work harder at it and then I saw that it was actually contributing to my business as a guitar maker so then I went much more into it so it's kind of this rolling thing you know about looking at what's working and then prioritizing that it feels like you came out of the gate on YouTube like with a voice and knowing how to film and, and everything. I mean, maybe there were some crude videos that you've deleted or hidden that I haven't seen, but you, the minute you launched your channel, it seems like you were, you know, you were vulnerable. You told a story. Well, you were compelling. And I, I think everyone that I've seen, I'm like, she's really got it down. Wow, that's not how I feel. So I really appreciate that. But I think what you have to remember is there are a lot of videos out there that I've deleted. And there are a lot of videos out there that I filmed and I didn't put up. And there are a lot of videos that are like trash. But again, if you just practice and you keep doing it at some point, you know, there'll always be someone who watches my videos and it's just like it's not good enough for them but there are always people who are on the other end of the spectrum where even your worst day is going to be good for someone so you just need to figure out like what that means to you and then get to a point where you're happy with the content and I don't think as a content creator I'm ever going to be happy enough with the content like even today I was filming this other style um that I kind of saw over the weekend on someone else's channel it's like this Chinese cooking channel and I was like god that's what I need to do so, and it's just really important to keep challenging yourself and from there you might be bad at this new genre, but you might actually, through doing that, get better at your old one. And then it's just like a, a staggered process. Um, I think the worst thing that you can do is to stop and be like, this is good enough. I think that's the case probably for my guitars as well. Um, in fact, I know it's the case for my guitars. <laughs> you know, I don't think any, any luthier would look at their guitar and be like, that's perfect, you know? Are you getting help with these videos? No, um... I got one edited about a month ago and I'm putting it out as the first one that I've ever got help with, which will be next month. So we'll see. If my channel blows up then, then I will accept that I need an editor. <laughs> but like right now I'm doing it all myself. So I film it all. Um, I do the sound design. I do all of the animation, all of the music. Oh, obviously I don't write the music. I, I use um, library music and then I edit it all myself and then upload it all myself, do everything like that myself because um I never want content creation to take money from my guitar business it, it's only the other way around so I'm happy to give content creation money back to the guitar business but I will never do it the other way around and until it's making enough money that I can hire an editor without dipping into my guitar money I'm not going to do it um it's just tough like I'll have to figure it out but what it does mean is that 
It gives me a nice extra paycheck every month to invest in materials, to invest in days of experimentation, to become a better luthier. That's why I do it. It's incredible. That's like two full-time jobs. Do you have a life at all beyond content creation and guitars? I think my secret is that I sleep a lot. Um, I sleep very well every night. I sleep for probably 10 hours every night. And for some reason, that charges my battery enough to have two full-time jobs. You know, I've got a wonderful relationship. I've got wonderful friends. Sometimes you have to be like, I'm going to take a day off. Uh, But that, again, helps it go back. Like, I always have enough time. I don't know why. I look after my body. I have amazing people around me who are far more impressive than me. And if I feel sad, I just take a look at them and I'm like, come on. Let's go, <laughs> it, which really helps. So. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about your, you, you mentioned taking the money from content creation, pouring it back into the guitar side of things. What does your studio look like now? Are you happy with all the tools you have? Are you, is it feel permanent or semi-permanent? Like, where are you at? Yeah, I'm at a sort of bit of a life, a life point where, you know, I don't like England anymore. So that's kind of an interesting one because I have just moved into my dream workshop. It's got a window, which I didn't have for a while. It's got all of my machinery that I love. I've built up a really beautiful collection of hand tools and power tools. But, you know, I don't think I'd be a business person if I was ever happy and settled as well. I think that that is fundamental if you're running a business it's always kind of looking at the next thing but instead I think nowadays it's very much looking for where I'm going to be happiest because when you're happiest you work the hardest you make the right decisions you do all of that so yeah I'm thinking at the moment like do I actually want to be in this country I mean politically it's a bit of a mess in terms of the weather that really bums me out when it's British um and and I want to keep having adventures and challenging myself so I don't know I might just like throw it all in the air and try and move somewhere warmer. Um, but if I was told that I have to stay in this workshop for the rest of my life, I'd still be happy because it's actually the most beautiful place to spend time. Um, it's it's like I'm beyond grateful that everything has sort of figured itself out and that I was able to come into this career. And obviously there were hard days, but I don't think that's particularly helpful to talk about because, again... I mean, it is sometimes, but there's there's such a there's such a lack of young people coming in because there are so many people who say how hard it is. So I don't want to be that person. Um, so that's why I that's why I'm being like extra positive. But I also do believe it. So if that if that helps. <laughs> what what's the sunnier climate? What's the ideal place to build guitars? It's a good question. Uh, I mean, I went to Nashville recently. Uh, I was actually, we were saying before we started recording, just for the record, that I was in Chicago at the same time as as your fretboard summit. And I can't believe it because that was complete coincidence. I was delivering a guitar to a client. Um, that's that's a key example, by the way, of taking money that's gone that's from content creation and giving it to guitar making. Like, I don't get them to pay for my flight. I just use that content creation money to take them their guitar. You know what I mean? So that's an example. But I was in Chicago with two guitars, actually, that I was delivering to clients. And I got a couple of messages being like, oh, I see you're in Chicago. Like, you're here for the summit. Let's catch up. I was like, what? No, surely not. Um, But I hear that it was like a great success. You had fun. Thank you. Yes, it was. Yes, I'm still here. I'm alive. Yeah. That's the main thing, famously, to to still be alive. (laughs) Yeah. How many guitars have you made so far? Are we talking like full client delivery or are we talking component guitars? You know, because I had that stage where I built like lots of different guitars. If if I'd finished those. Okay. So I think I probably made six guitars in that first phase that I didn't show anyone. Um, I think I posted a video where I was like routing the binding channels for my YouTube on one of them. But God, I built a lot of stuff that year and probably I've delivered to clients about seven, six, six or seven. Yeah. Nice. I think the other thing that I really find refreshing um, in your delivery on your website, on social media, on video is that you're very like matter of fact about price point. Like you put the price of one of your guitars in that recent video that you just 
uh, showed that you were referencing. A lot of luthiers downplay that or are maybe a little self-effacing or worried about the reaction. You're very upfront. Like it's this was a thirty-six thousand dollar guitar, I believe, is what you posted on that one. Is that part of again looking at other industries, looking at fashion, looking at other luxury brands, and going like, why aren't we talking about this guitar should cost this much? Yeah, you're absolutely right, and and I'm very aware how angry that makes some people. And you know, ultimately, what I'm going to say is like, what am I going to do? Not do it? Like, if there's demand for that, I'm going to do it. Someone needs to do it. Um, I've worked with luthiers. I've seen how much work goes into these things. If I could reset the industry, I would still be cheap, like compared with some of these people. But unfortunately, nobody has done that for a long time. Um, I think some people are, but it's like beginners come in and they have to charge X amount and they just, it just doesn't work business wise. It just doesn't, you can't make handmade guitars for the price point that some of the newbies are coming in and doing. And I will happily sacrifice myself and my integrity or whatever people want to call it to try and help. Um, Because what I've done by setting that price point, I've noticed is I think exclusively all of my clients, I am their first hand-built guitar with the exception of maybe two. Um, What that means is that these people who, because, you know, my clients are very smart people. They're very successful people and they have never asked me why is this so expensive they've just been like yeah I'll take it that's amazing um and this is the kind of client that I want to bring into the industry because I think it will make guitar making a more realistic pursuit not only realistic but fulfilling and viewed as a a more kind of artistic role because like luthiers are artists and I definitely consider my work as functional art and again you, you only need look at the actual art industry to see that um People aren't shouting down Damien Hurst, Tracy M and all of these people who've been very successful at creating a price point that is like staggeringly impressive. Um, People don't yell at them because it's normalized. Right. So I would walk into, you know, if I walked into anybody's workshop who was like a master luthier and I'd look around and I'd be like, it's worth a hundred grand. I'd be like, you are a wizard. If I had the money, I'd buy it. Unfortunately, I don't, but some people do and they still feel like that. And because they haven't been exposed to the industry, they're still in that mindset of like, this is art. I'm going to pay for it. So, again, it's just like, you know, I can't I don't do guitar shows because I don't view myself on the same um, in the same industry as like people who've been making guitars for 50 years. Like that doesn't make any sense. I am 29. I've been doing this for like, you know, not that long. How dare I? be in a guitar show and charge that much next to someone else. It's a different, I've taken a different business model. I'm okay with that because I give a lot of value to my clients in storytelling and other people can't because they're, because they can't afford to give that time. So, so that's, that's why I've done it. And it is really hard when people don't understand why I'm doing it, but ultimately I'm trying to do it to help. And also, if I didn't do it, I couldn't afford to do it. So what am I going to do? Like, just because I'm offending this elderly gentleman who thinks I'm wrong on the internet, like, what am I going to do? Like, be like, I'm so sorry. I'm going to go work in a cafe now. Like, apologies. You know, I I had this, the most wonderful, uh, the most wonderful moment with my client who I brought, I hand delivered his guitar in Florida. This was the one that was 36 grand. And he, I brought it to his house and, you know, I I actually filmed the delivery or his, his mate did, um, his mate filmed the delivery for me, but he was like, I walked in, I gave him the guitar and he was just like, you should have charged me double. Like, what are you doing? You need to like, what are you doing? And I was like, I actually disagree at this point, but, um, and then he, he lifted it out and he was just like, okay, you can take your case, you can take your case away. And I was like, no, the case is for you. And he was like, you've definitely undercharged me here. And it was just interesting because he's like, a a very successful businessman and he has never seen a handmade guitar like oh he's he's got a guitar collection don't get me wrong I think probably some of them are handmade but not one that's by a modern luthier um and I think that whole attitude is a lot bigger than we think but again people don't know that this industry exists which is why I'm so passionate about doing the social media I want to get these amazing colleagues that I worked with that I see like I don't know I just 
I just think everyone is amazing who's a luthier because it's really hard. Like, I don't know how people are so blasé about it. Like, it's so difficult, <laughs> uh, you know? So, yeah, I just did. I also, it's worth saying, I didn't create this price point for myself. I have a dealer. They decided it for me. Um, I don't think I would have had, had the balls to do it. Um, but I had the balls to accept and trust them. And I've sold... I've sold out of those price point guitars like within a week of them being advertised. So like, again, I'm not going to complain. I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. And I hope that other people who are coming into the industry will be inspired to up their price point in accordance with their skill. Okay. Yeah. I agree with everything you just said. I'm also, my mind is a little blown that you just use the guy's friend to help you film it. Cause it felt like there was a film crew there. <laughs> so <laughs> amazing. You're you're impressing me left and right. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah, Ryan. <laughs> I, I literally watched that video going like, wow. Yeah, I literally watched that video going like, wow, Daisy like had a film crew with her flying across the pond. Amazing. Um, <laughs> no I'm way. also guessing these, these business people who are maybe nude or coming at this handmade modern guitar thing from a, uh, you know, with a fresh perspective – they're probably just letting you have a little bit more freedom in terms of, I don't know, Daisy, tell me what amazing wood I should put on this guitar. Is, is that happening too? Because I feel like the, the more traditional uh, collectors of these like uber high-end guitars are like so exacting and it's so detailed and specialized to that one person's preference. Do you have a little bit more leeway to be an artist? Yeah, again, that's why I sell them where I sell them because like I am not the person you come to if you want like a fan fret uh slotted headstock dreadnought copy with the scale length is you know 25 to 27 like I'm not that girl there are so many people who would do that better than me I don't know why you come to me for that what people want to come to me for is making sure that their instrument tells a good story because I'm I'm I've got an eye for that um and that's tends to be more what functional art should be anyway so again like I'm very happy to fill those shoes I've had clients reach out to me asking for all of those things and I've sent them to Rosie my my uh the person who taught me because she is really good at that stuff and I'm not um <laughs> I was like you should go to the person who taught me because she's amazing um and like that's just not me and that's fine uh but again I think that's why I wouldn't class myself in the same category as like another you know other luthiers who've been doing it for all these years they have experience doing that i don't i'm a storyteller that's my brand where uh where do things stand now you sold out of the run of thirty six thousand dollar guitars so does that mean we're going up in price uh for the next batch i don't think so i don't think so i'm i'm happy like with it i don't need more um I would actually, what I'm doing with that cost is taking a break from those slots and I'm building a guitar for charity that I'm going to probably raffle off for about £10 a ticket. So somebody who wouldn't be able to afford one can have one and that's all paid for. Um, and then I'm going to donate the money to the conservation of an area of land in Kenya where I get some of my tone woods from. Like, I don't feel good about that, but the reality is people want exotic hardwoods. So the way I offset that is to create some kind of charity project. So that that high price point will also go back into the industry. It will go back to the people who can't afford it and it will get them a guitar for a tenor, which is really exciting because I would love to do that for someone. And um, I think that that's the most responsible way of of using a high price point. Like it's not all going in my pocket. I'm absolutely feeding it back. It could go into my pocket, but I don't have a lot to spend stuff on. Like I buy machinery now with my social media income. So it's like everything I earn from a guitar goes towards my rent um, or funding projects that can push things back. And it sounds like I'm virtue signaling, but I actually just have a real guilt complex if I don't um it's like actually quite selfish so it's hard to kind of say all that without sounding like I'm doing a PR stunt um because I actually just think that I really love my job and if I can keep doing it then I will and yeah I don't need to 
I don't feel like I need to increase the price point. There'll be a time probably where I do just from a business perspective. Um, but right now is not the time. I'm very happy working on these charity projects and doing my thing. So yeah, it's a good question though. And, uh, you've, you've confessed a few times during this interview that you're a bit of a control freak. Do you ever see having employees? Um, I'll be honest, like the business side of my head says yes, but the, the, I will never make millions because I want to, I want to keep it just me and I want to do tangible good. I think once you get past a point of a company where you have X amount of employees, it's actually really hard to to um, make sure that the company is still doing good and the quality is there. And my whole thing is the fact that I am the person making the guitar. That's not scalable. So in that regard, no, it's not because I don't like working with people. I actually have worked with people. I've hired freelancers and I've made sure that I pay them properly because I could have really used a job like that back when I was trying to figure stuff out. So that's something that's important to me. I can't afford to pay someone as much as I'd like to pay them and give them the attention that they need and be a good boss and not like be unbelievably stressed. So yeah, I haven't done that. I just will get people in, like I said, with this video editor, who's actually editing the video that will promote the charity project for the African conservation charity. I got an editor in for that. Uh, we had a great time doing it, uh, took a load off my mind and that was a fun experience, but I also got to say goodbye to him at the end of the project. And it was a nice relationship. I'm also very scared of being a bad boss. I don't, I don't have any experience being a boss. I don't know if I'd be any good. It freaks me out the idea of taking someone on before I know myself in that regard. Yeah. That's, that's very self-aware of you. Not many people would do that. Uh, anxiety TM. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the whole other thing that you do that no one in the guitar world has ever done, which is like, you talk about self care and I mean, you have, you have a better health as one of your sponsors. Um, most luthiers try to put on a game face and, and not talk of it about, you know, how this is actually a, a hard way to make a living. Yeah, it's actually hectic that like no one does that. <laughs> it's actually hectic. Like imagine pretending that you're not mentally ill if you want to be a luthier. Like very odd. Uh so I kind of yeah, I try not only obviously, you know, I've got to find sponsors for the channel that that's, goes into this whole thing like I do it because it makes money for my luthery business on top of my luthery business. That's why I do it. But yeah, I like had a chat with my manager and he was like, who do you want us to get? And I, I said better help because they genuinely helped me during lockdown. Um, I know that a lot of people say that they leak, de leak data and that kind of thing. And, and yeah, I know that's true. I know that they've actually fixed that now and they've apologized. So I'm okay still working with them. My therapist is a legend. She's really helped me. And yeah, I think it's important to talk about like it's so, yeah, I, I just imagine like hiding that, I suppose, again, because I am so connected to my instruments, it's, it feels responsible to admit that. Otherwise you're selling a product that isn't authentic. Perhaps. Mm -hmm. I just think that beyond the guitars, which at least from afar look exquisite and I'm sure are, um, what you're doing on that front, the videos, which, you know, sometimes feel almost like ASMR videos. Like you were talking about the, the cooking shows from filmed in Asia like you're you're exposing a lot of people to this side of guitar making who otherwise would never bother to watch a guitar channel. So I appreciate it. Thank you. I really appreciate you saying that. It means a lot. I know it's I know it's not everyone's cup of tea, but it's it's good to get eyes on the screen when it comes to an industry that is going to die if if we don't, you know, make sure it's being seen and appreciated. Where are you at with wood right now? You've, you've used some exquisite woods in some of your builds that I'm assuming cost an arm and a leg to get and were hard to get. Um, what are you using? What are you looking forward to using in the next year? Talk to me about that. Well, I had a client who I got off the back of a YouTube video who wanted me to get the finest set of the tree that I possibly could and use that. So that's probably what, like the most show stopping thing that I've ever seen in my life and sitting on my shelf right now. I'm just like, whoa, hectic. Um, but it's really nice. Like I buzz by it every day and I'm like, oh, a la chica looking sexy. And then I think apart from that, I've got like, 
some I've got some oak which is again like my wood supplier down in uh, Sussex I've got kind of a few dotted around but the one that I get the English stuff from is down in Sussex and he his team kind of when I went there last time they were just like you know your you know marketing is your thing if you can tell a story around some wood which is more sustainable and kind of get people using that it would actually be really good so they gave me some I think I want to say it's like spalted oak it's it's not a good tone wood but I think that I can find a home for it um just based on the fact that it's absolutely beautiful to look at like I'll happily admit it's probably not got the best tap test but if I use a really really striking top wood um a really good top wood to complement it I think it would be a beautiful guitar so I might use some of that for the Africa build I think that would be really, really special because then I've sort of given something from my own homeland back to the project. That would be a bit of a slap in the face if I then use some like African Paduke from the very area that I'm trying to conserve. <laughs> so I thought maybe it would be a good chance to tell a story around that. Um, and so that's really exciting. But I don't tend to keep a lot of wood in my shop because A, I get distracted and B, I think that I like to get materials in and use them straight away to the best of my ability because I want I don't want to see them as like a a big rack of things that are disposable like I think having a small amount in there really makes you appreciate them more because if you do make a mistake you can't just grab a new one like you have to make it work so yeah do you build one guitar at a time or do you build them in batches of two or three uh currently I build one at a time so this this charity guitar obviously I'm going to build standalone um and then i'll get back to commissions when that's done yeah okay which again is more like an artist would it's not it's not like a batch situation again that's sort of how i've tried to build the company and i think that's important for my clients to know if they are paying a premium it's like i work on this one at a time i'm i'm all yours i'm not spreading myself then if you've got questions i'm here for you you know and since you mentioned you have a manager, do you try to put the videos out with some sort of frequency and regularity, or is it sort of like when the guitar is done? Um, I just really enjoy it. So, like, my manager will get me... If I say to him, I'll be like... His name's Jason, actually. Hi, Jason, if you're watching. Another Jason. <laughs> but yeah, I'll just be like, I've got a couple of cool ideas. Have you got any like sponsors you want to get on board so they can, you know, fund the experimentation essentially. Um, so if I'm doing like one where I want to do a video about spray finishing, it's, it's sort of a three way value. So I can afford to spend longer on it. I can afford to like grow my business by, and also educate people around it. And also sometimes I don't know what I'm doing. So like I learned spray finishing quite recently. So I kind of like doing that in the video. I'm just like, actually I, this might be wrong but let's go with it. And, you know, people like those ones as well. And yeah, it's like, I'll say, I'll basically say to my manager, like, I've got one, this coming up that I want to put out. But because in, interestingly, Luthery is so, as you know, it's got so many different processes. Like there's always a video idea to be done. And I'm always doing something interesting that I do want to share with my audience. Because again, it just highlights like how amazing Luthery is and how difficult it is. And it just goes back to what I was saying earlier about, you know, the price point. It's like, these people are wizards. Like, I, I don't feel like I'll ever be as good as someone like, I'm not to name drop, but like Michael Bashkin, for example, who I like deeply admire. I'm like, wow, one day I'll be as good as him, maybe. Um, but yeah, it's just, yeah, it's interesting. It, it must be like a different mindset in terms of just your production where, it must take you twice as long to build a guitar because you're also filming it, but you're getting income, so you're not having to build two guitars in that time. Am I am I anywhere on the right track here? <laughs> like you're not wrong. I think uh, to be honest, just through doing it, like it doesn't actually. I think like so. I filmed an entire build, which we were speaking about earlier, and that took a fair bit longer, but also kind of didn't because I just like. All we're doing here is setting up the shot and then I crack on. Like setting up the shot takes like 30 seconds. So it's not actually that difficult. For you. Yeah. For most mortals, it would not. <laughs> it's practice. Like it's practice. And I think that when I'm doing videos about where I'm talking to camera, that takes a lot more time. But for that full build, like 90% of it was 
just setting up a shot and then I filmed the entire talking bit on a day it took me a day to film that talking bit and then that was it and then the rest was in the editing and I was moving workshop when I was editing it anyway so I couldn't do any making so I kind of like strategically (laughs) set that up to happen all at the same time but yeah I mean it's it can it can be time consuming depending on the project obviously like one time I built a xylophone of different tone woods just to kind of see what would happen it was not scientific but again that took like a day to build or something like that so that takes time but when I'm actually building the guitars it's content anyway so it kind of feeds into each other it's like a very symbiotic relationship which is great I mean, it's you did the one on sharpening uh, the chisel and it's just you've got a curiosity and such a great delivery. That's just so cool to watch. Like, I'm a big fan. May I really appreciate that. I'm a big fan of you guys as well. I'm just so grateful to be on this podcast. I can't believe it. It's such a joy. <laughs> of course. Are are young girls finding you? I mean, you mentioned Rosie and you're, you're two of the, you know, there's not many female luthiers, unfortunately, in the world working at a high level. Like, are are, are young women finding you and, and finding this channel and, and approaching you the way all of these clients are? Oh, man, it's actually, like, so exciting. So I'll get a comment every now and then on YouTube and it'll be from, like, a dad or a granddad or someone. Obviously, it's a very masculine world, and men generally find my channel, like, they find they watch it above the women percentage, which is, like, fine, because these men have daughters, they have granddaughters, and they'll write in a comment being like, my daughter saw you doing this on YouTube, I showed her you doing this, and then she wanted to come help me in my guitar shop the next day. And it's like, that is so one like that's all I that's all I ask you know that's wonderful because I think if you're visible doing it and and I've got I've got women who are so wanting to be luthiers but like I was chatting to one today and I actually had to like stop talking to her because I was being met with fear and you can't have a rational argument with fear she was like I don't want to put out YouTube videos because I'm scared of the comments because I'm a woman and I was like I I can't talk to you now because you're living in fear and you're not the person who's supposed to do this work. I don't really get scared anymore. I'll I'll try and like normalize it as much as I can, but we've got a lot of work to do. Actually, I don't get many bad comments these days, which is weird. Um and it's just like communicating that's really hard because maybe it's because I've stopped seeing them because I don't actually care anymore because I know they're all g- always going to be there. But for for people like my friend who wants to get into it, she is crippled by this fear of getting a bad comment. And I can't, I don't know how to tell her kindly. It's not because you're a woman. It's because you're like, it won't be because you're a woman. It'll be because you're doing something that the other people want to be doing. And they're not, they'll use the fact you're a woman, maybe if they're feeling creative, but like, it's not about that. Um, women are probably more equipped to succeed in in a modern world. I know it's not fashionable or feminist to say that, but we're different. Use that. You you might have to go through a bit of like battling, but if it's not the fact you're a woman, it would be something else. Like men get bad comments too. And use the fact that you're different to provide a fresh perspective. Talk about like, I don't know, getting your period when you're you're supposed to be in the workshop. Like you can talk about, if you talk about the uncomfortable stuff, women will be like, oh my God, like, you know, there are, there are people like me doing this. Maybe, maybe I can try as well. It just takes a few of us to actually band together and just put two fingers to everyone who uses it as an excuse to not let us in. And we're probably going to be in the best position to get past any future obstacles if we harden our skin at this time and just move forward. That's my take on it, you know. Amazing. I mean, I know a lot of guys who are scared of the comments as well. And and I think that having that thick skin and or just not reading the comments is such a invaluable skill that so many of us need to learn. But we're all we're all freaking out. Yeah, man, everyone's so cripplingly anxious, like even if they're not talking about it. So, you know, (laughs) so you can't work on your own all day without being anxious. Like it's just not it's not part of being human. It's part of the package deal. So yeah, you're absolutely right. Everyone, you know, there's a lot, lot more people who are male who get more upset than I do for sure. Well, Daisy, um, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for doing this. And, uh, I, I can't wait to see the next video. 
Oh man, thank you so much. I've had such a great little chat. I forgot that we're being recorded. Like it was just so nice to chat to you, Jason. I'd love to meet you in person someday. <laughs> I'm going to make you come to Chicago with or without a guitar. So yes, sir. With a guitar, probably, because I could use your feedback. That'd be nice. All right, back to Seattle. I am so glad you tuned in. Thanks for making it this far. Thank you to Daisy Tempest for talking to us. I can't wait to see where her career takes her. And I will be back next week with another episode of the Fretboard Journal podcast.